Hello and welcome to the Erlang Solutions monthly webinar. My name is Mladen Milicic and I'm the VP for the EMEA region here at Erlang Solutions. Today's webinar represents a continuation of a series of webinars we have been running uh, in and around topics uh, to do with Erlang, Elixir and related technologies. Today we will specifically be talking about React Core and also about Dalmatiner DB. We will explore how the two solutions and the two technologies interact together and what the similarities and the differences are between, between these two distinct products. Now, as with any live event, uh, please do excuse any technical difficulties that we may face today. But to start by telling you a bit about Erlang Solutions, we are a products and services uh, orientated company completely dedicated to Erlang and Elixir and solutions based on the Beam. We work with companies and individuals uh, fostering Erlang, fostering Elixir, fostering the Beam. Uh, we hold conferences globally and work on projects across industries. We also develop products based on Erlang and Elixir. Some of them you probably have heard of. Um, our Mongoose IM messaging platform, which has been widely used in social media, financial services, gaming, and so on. And our Wombat OAM monitoring and management technology for Erlang and Elixir systems. Now, I'm truly privileged to say that our speaker today is Heinz Gies, uh, who is truly a technical visit uh, and a technical lead at uh, Project FIFO. We're uh, very privileged to have Heinz uh, joining us and talking about React Core and talking about Dalmatiner DB. Just to say that uh, you are very welcome to pose questions throughout the duration of this webinar. You can use the chat facility on the webinar's interface to do so. Our speaker, Heinz, will answer as many questions as time allows at the end of the webinar. If any questions do go unanswered, you will see my personal email in the last slide uh, of Heinz's presentation. You can use that to send us any questions that have gone unanswered in writing and we'll obviously answer all of these uh, after the webinar. Now, if you use Twitter, uh, have a look at the following hashtag. Uh, so hashtag Erlang Solutions Talks. Our team will be tweeting live throughout the duration of the webinar. And you, our esteemed members of the audience, are very welcome to contribute from your perspective. I would now like to hand over to Heinz, who will be glad to start us off. Hey, good evening or afternoon, everyone. First of all, let me say thank you for having me, and I really hope that all of you get the chance to take something interesting with you today. So we'll be talking about React Core <clears throat> and its place in databases and distributed systems. Um, before we start off with the content, I want to give us a quick look at the agenda so you can follow along and know where we are in the global scope of things. We'll start with defining a few goals for today so that everything you hear can be put in proper context and you're not surprised or disappointed about something missing or something said that you wouldn't have expected. We'll then introduce two databases, React and DalmatinaDB. Those will be the two examples we use to look at what React Core can give us and the features and possibilities we get with the system. We'll then take a peek under the hood for operations performed on React and Dalmatina DB. This allows us to see how those databases, which are fairly different, use a common core framework to achieve vastly opposite results in many places. With that done, we'll take a look at what React Core provides to those databases <coughs> and the possibilities that you have with it and some of the other libraries. So let's talk about our goals. This is not going to be a technical deep dive. React Core and distributed systems in general are a huge topic and we couldn't even scratch the surface if we want to go into the details. It would be a bit over the top for the next 30 to 45 minutes. What we are going to do is we want to look at some examples of React Core. And we are doing this 
by looking at how it is used and the concepts that can be realized with this library. Now, as I said before, I want to ask you to ask questions whenever something is unclear. I'm pretty sure we have a very diverse audience and the experience you have with React, React Core, or Dalmatina DB is very different from person to person. And I couldn't possibly cover all the ground and give the needed detail on every aspect without totally blowing the time frame. So if something is too unclear for you, please ask, and we'll try to answer it at the end of the presentation. Now, let's go into introducing our two databases, React and DalmatinaDB. This is not about how they are operated, how to use them. This is about the concepts. So here we go. They have quite a few commonalities. First of all, both databases are eventual consistent. And since this is a bit of a pet peeve of mine, I want to lose a few words on what eventual consistent means in this context. Too often I have encountered situations where you men mention eventual consistency and people get scared that it means your data will be wrong all the time. That's not quite correct. If we're talking about eventual consistency, what you should imagine is that most of the time your data is consistent only in edge cases and when something goes considerably wrong, this eventual comes into play and some of the replies might not be consistent. Both systems are based on a dynamo architecture, but fear not, I will not show you the dreaded and famous React ring, which I think is usually part of every presentation that touches React or React Core. Um, but it's important to know that those systems are not based, not new inventions. They are based on an existing and well-proven technology. There's a wonderful paper on this, which is the Amazon Dynamo paper. And everyone who is truly interested in learning the depths of this concept is welcome to read it. There will be a link to it in the last slide. Both the databases have the option to grow and shrink dynamically, which is not all that common in databases today. And while it is not necessarily important for code, it gives a huge operational flexibility that you're not bound to handle sharding and this kind of stuff in your application, but just can add it to your database. It lets you plan easier and let uh, without having to perfectly scope out the amount of hardware you need by just adding or removing nodes as time goes. Furthermore, the database is horizontally scalable, which <coughs> is also quite important when it comes to planning. You do not need to tell your application about new nodes you join. Rather, that adding new nodes will just improve the overall capacity in both computational time and storage of the whole database. So those are the big commonalities between Damatina DB and React. Let's look at some of the differences. Starting with React, React is an incredibly versatile database. There are numbers over numbers of use cases. You can use it to store commands in a block, you can use it to store shopping carts, you can use it to store user accounts. It is a general purpose database, so you're not set to anything. This comes with the fact that it allows for complex data, which makes it easy. It's not a simple key value store in the sense of that you have one key and some opaque value to the database. React understands quite a few different data types, some of them specialized for eventual consistency, the so-called CRDTs, which amongst others are sets, so sets of data, which are nested maps, which are counters, and they let you build an application with React understanding some parts of the data and the structure, which helps a lot. React prioritizes data availability. This in many places is really important. You want to know that when React tells you your user account has been written, that you will later on be able to get this account back. 
and not be told by the database, hey, it's not here. Now, there is a grain of salt. Eventual consistency means that it will only eventually tell you it is there. Again, not during normal operations, but in edge cases that can happen. But generally, when React tells you it has written the data, React has written the data and it is safe. That is a really good peace of mind to have in a database. React cares a lot about predictable latencies as well. So when you make a query, you can be pretty sure that it will be answered in about the same time every time you query it. This helps for planning on capacity to understand how fast your other code needs to be to give your users a certain performance. Now, these are the general specifics of React. There's surely a bit more, but we'll focus on them because they are in contrast to some of the decisions that were made when building Dalmatina DB. So the second of our two databases is not a general purpose database. It is incredibly task specific. The Matina DB was built for one purpose, and that is monitoring and time series storage of operational metrics. When I talk about operational metrics, generally think that it is, for example, the CPU usage of a server. They occur on a regular basis, on a fixed interval, once a second, once every 10 seconds, whatever you use for your monitoring. They always have the same data types, so the Matina DB only knows one type of data, and that is numbers. Now, it's not always numbers, so it can differentiate between a float, an integer, or a not written number, so a nan. But in general, there is no complex data types here. It's just a number or not a number. Now, while React prioritizes data survivability, the big priority for the Matina DB is rather different. It is ingress availability. What this means is that for operational metrics, it's more important that a vast majority of your metrics arrive than that you get clear confirmation that every single time was written. Now, that so sounds a bit off, but if you think about it, if you have one second of CPU usage not written, the importance of that is rather low. Usually, every operational metric is looked at at a 10 second, one minute, hell, one hour window and aggregated over it. So a single missing value does not really have that much effect. Now, this couples a bit with a high throughput, the next point, um, since it very much mitigates the chance of data loss in the trade-off for general availability of having some metrics written. Now, Dalmatina DB heavily features throughput over latency. And that makes sense if you're using a monitoring a large set of servers, it's more important that thousands of servers are managing to write their data than if it's written within one milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, or even a second. So this implies some of the trade-offs. To give you a feeling when I'm talking about high throughput here, it's not 10% faster. We are talking about one to two orders of magnitude compared to other systems. Going back to the ingress availability, why dropping one point is not so bad. If you have 10 times more points anyway, you still have nine points, no, eight points more than another database if you have a higher throughput. Okay, so now we have had a general look at the two databases we are talking about today and some of the design goals involved in them which impact the decisions made in their implementation. Next, we'll look at something reading and writing in both databases. We'll start off with React. Please understand before I go to the next graphic that this is not meant to be 100% correct. The whole algorithm for reading and writing is a lot more complicated than what is shown here. But once you see the image, you will understand that I am not going into full detail. So. This example is for reading data from React with a configuration of n equals 3 and r equals 2. That means all data is replicated to three hosts, and for a successful read, we require two of those hosts to reply. So 
Let's talk about the little boxes at the top for a second before we go into the arrows. The user is you or your system. The API would be the HTTP API or protobuf API provided by React to which you send your request. The FSM is a finite state machine, a piece of logic that handles how the read is performed and interacts with the other components behind the API. The ring manager is a component from React Core that keeps track of how your ring, how your database is sharded over all the systems that are part of your cluster. We have three sets of proxy and node here. The proxy is a little piece of code, actually a very interesting piece of code inside the React Core repository that handles, amongst other things, and most importantly, load. So this piece of code decides when it's actually okay to keep on sending data and keeps your actual node protected from overload. The node, or more correct V node, is the implementation of your database logic that gets sharded over your ring, so over your cluster. So now that we have a general understanding of those wonderful little boxes, let's talk about the arrows. So a read starts when the user sends a request to the API saying, please React, give me the user Heinz. He wants to log in. I need to know if he can. The API gets the request and decodes it. And then it starts a new process, the FSM. The FSM will be handling now all the logic. It start off with asking the ring manager, hey, can you please tell me how my cluster looks? Who would I need to talk to? The ring manager, having all this information, hands it back to the FSM. Now, we have now the information of the whole FSM and we know what data we want to read. So the FSM continues to build the query plan, which means it will figure out which nodes in our replica hold the data. Now, if we look back up, we have a n equals three, so we know three nodes will hold the data. Now, in this example, it's node one, two, and three, mostly because those are always present when you have an n at three. It could be other nodes, but let's stick with those. So what the FSM now does, it sends a request to the three proxies, which are responsible for the nodes. So it sends a request saying, give me the data for the user Heinz from to proxy one, that sends it onto node one, to proxy two, which sends it onto node two, to proxy three, which sends it onto node three. Now, if one of those nodes would be overloaded, the proxy would tell us, hey, stop, we can't do that. Try again later, or perhaps you can continue because we only need two replies. Now, our nodes do the work. They look in the database on disk or in memory and figure out, is there a user Heinz and what data is there for him? So they will reply. We see in this example that they do not need to reply in order. This is actually really important as it comes into play when we are thinking back about the latency. Since you only need two of the nodes to reply, a node which happens to have higher load, in our example node two, can reply a bit delayed and you still get a good low latency and a dependable latency on your request. So. In this example, node three replies first, despite being the last one getting the message, and then replies node one. Now, the FSM now has two replies, which if we look up the R value of two, is enough to let the user know what we found. And the FSM replies back to the API, and that goes to the user saying, hey, here is your user Heinz. Now, what you do with the user Heinz, it's up to you, but the FSM is not quite done yet. Since we ask three nodes, we are going to get three replies back. So for the sake of the example, node two had a different idea what Heinz is. This is one of the parts of this eventual consistency. Perhaps while Heinz was updated the last time, node two was down, who knows? Now, what the FSM does, it compares those three replies and finds out, well, one is different, let's repair that. This is called the read repair. Now, if we were smart and stored our users in the CRDT, the magic is completely happening in those data, so data sets and <clears throat> can be automatically repaired. There are other methods, but that would be going too deep. Now, the repair request goes back to the node two proxy and then goes back to node two. 
So this is an example how React would read data. Next up, we are going to look at writing which oddly enough looks a bit simpler than the reading. This is because we don't need to take care of repairs in this place. The same as with our read example, we have the boxes at the top. They are not different, so I'm not going to go into detail. We have an n value of three, though data is stored in three places, and we have a w value, not an r value this time, of two again. The W value, just like the R value, specifies how many nodes need to confirm a write before we can say it is successful. So in this installation, it would be the same as a reads. Now, let's start from the left again. And we say, we add a new user, and let's call him Frank. So you add your user Frank and tell the API, please write this user. The API, again, decodes your messages and starts the FSM. This time it's a different FSM. It's a write FSM, not a read FSM. But a lot of the steps are the same. So it will start with asking for the ring. And the ring manager diligently will reply with, here is how your cluster looks. Now, using this information, the FSM can figure out which nodes are required to handle the data. Now. It builds a query plan, even so it is a write, given that the system itself, React Core, doesn't know it is a write, it's still considered a query. The same as with reads, we send the request to the proxies, proxy one, proxy two, and proxy three. Those, given there is no overload situation, continue to hand them on to the fee node itself. That does a work, and once it is sure that it was stored to disk, it's going to confirm the write. We see again, because I was too lazy to change the arrows, node three replies first, node one replies second, and then the FSM knows, okay, we have two writes confirmed, so we can tell the user, your data is safe. Finally, the last node, node two replies, and we are done with writing data. Now, Next up, let's look at the same on DalmatinaDB. Now, I will start with the writing on this side because it is, the, it is a very different from React. Well, the reading is pretty much the same and I want to have your memory fresh about the writing we just talked when we're looking at how DalmatinaDB does it. Now, you can already see this is a lot longer than what we saw on the React side. We have the same general configuration of three replicas and a write value of two. So two needs to be confirmed. Now, what you might see if you pay close attention to our little boxes is there is no FSM here involved. Part of the optimization for throughput is that some of the safety nets and some of the safety measures are removed in Dalmatina DB and it handles stuff more direct. Another thing you will see is that we don't handle one right here. That is because Dalmatina DB, to perform higher throughput, batches writes. So what happens is the user writes its CPU, its memory usage, disk IO, process time, you name it, there are millions of metrics you could probably write, and it keeps sending them at a quick pace. Especially with monitoring, usually those happen in bursts. And the Martina DB, since it's not general purpose, can take advantage of this knowledge. So it will collect a number of writes, and at one point, the API will say, okay, we have had enough now. You have sent us quite a few writes. Let's actually persist. So just as React, it asks the ring manager, hey, can you give me the class layout? And that will reply. Now, here's the next big difference. It now will batch those writes up. So all the writes that go to node one will be batched into one write going to node one. So if you have a thousand writes happening in one of those batches and a ring size of say 64 nodes, 
you are at maximum doing 64 writes, not a thousand. And that can save considerable time at the expense of latency. Since the write itself is bigger, it's a thousand divided by 64 messages instead of just one. But that will take longer, but it will have a higher throughput. Now, looking at this, it goes to the proxy again. And not only for node one, two, and three, but all the way up to node n. So we will create 64 write requests at a time and then wait for them to come back. Now, there's no confirmation here going on to the user, which goes back to the fact that we do prioritize the general ability to write metrics over confirming for every write that it was done, com done correctly. Now, I think this gives a very good idea how prioritizing throughput over latency affects design decisions. Next up, we look at reading. And reading is nearly the same between the Martina DB and React. The user sends a request. The API starts an FSM. The FSM is going to ask the ring manager, where can I get my data? And the ring manager replies. We are building a query plan, which is slightly different here, since we might need to ask more than our three nodes, or actually do more than read one read request if we are reading over a large time span. But for simplicity, we say all the data we need is within one time span and not sharded over multiples. So we send three requests to the nodes again and get the replies. The same as in React, two replies will be enough for our system to tell the user, here's your data. Now, when the first reply arrives, we'll do this same read repair process with a slight difference. DamatinaDB has an understanding about what the data that is stored in it means. This additional knowledge lets us do some tricks. Just like for batching, while reading, we know that data is time indexed. And we know that the most recent data being slightly off might not be a inconsistency, but just the interleaving of messages. Imagine node one and two got a write request for just the last second before they got the read request. Node three, on the other hand, got the read request just after it got the right request. So there would be a slight difference, one, one second out of date. And if you're reading frequently, which in metrics you might to show your dashboard, you would get a storm of read repairs in every second. So what Dalmatina DB does, it says, if your data is very recent, we don't read repair it. We only read repair data that's in the past to cut out those few seconds of possible inconsistency which would then be fixed later on on later reads. So if our difference in this example would lay beyond this threshold of this data is too recent to repair, we would get a repair and the same way as in React, we would rewrite our data and now have consistent data over all three nodes. So we have seen how those two systems work when reading or writing data. We have seen a bit about the trade-offs that happen in the design of either system and where the priorities lie. Now, I want to show you a quick idea. What are all the components that go into it? Now, please keep in mind, this is just a small snapshot. React itself has a lot more components and dependencies, but I want to give you a general idea how it's put together. So we have the database React, and it has React Core, a React KV, the key value store. It's one of its main components, but there are others like authentication and a few more. KV itself then uses React Core to do a good bit of its lifting. But in addition to that, it has other components. It has the FSMs we talked about, the read and write FSM. It has a vNode implementation for storing the data. The node we send messages to is that. It has an API model which handles the API. It has multiple data stores to store your data, for example, LevelDB or Bitcask. Now, this is how React in a simplified view is built. Looking at the MartinaDB, it is 
less general purpose and more specified, so it can be built leaner, but we see a lot of the same components in a sense. We have React Core as a big block of it, but on the orange side to the right, that's very different. We have the metric vnode instead of the key value vnode. We have a different API. Instead of level DB and BitCask, we have something called mStore and eStore and IO node. This is all different. I want to give you a quick, since I promised to talk about other libraries, which is really, really only a short moment. Um, I want to talk about the little green stuff here. There is Fultzum, which offers measurements and performance metrics for the database. There's Lager, which is my absolute favorite logging framework in the world. It is brilliant, and I use it in every project I ever build. There is Click, which is a CLI tool, which uses the configuration that Cuttlefish, the config file management, provides. And all those make building these applications really valuable, and all those are, in a way, part of React Core. Now, last but not least, what of all this does React Core give us? One of the big features that React Core provides to both these databases is cluster management. The whole handleship of hand, handleship, the whole handling of membership, joining or removing nodes, dealing with a node that we know is down, replacing it, that is all provided by React Core and does not need to be implemented in React or Damatina DB. All administrative tasks like show me my nodes, show me my ring. Where is the stager? All this is handled by React Core as well. So neither Dalmatina DB nor React needed to implement that. A lot of the monitoring in the sense of both performance to a degree and uptime and reliability is done in React Core. We know which V nodes are down. We know which nodes are down. <coughs> Excuse me. And we can handle with it. React Core comes with something which is called metadata. It is a mini built-in key value store, which both React and Dalmatina DB use to store information about buckets, groupings of keys. That doesn't need to be implemented again in either of the databases. It handles distribution. We have seen the proxy which routes data to the node that's needed. We have we, it handles failures. So if a node goes down, React, will out, React Core will automatically route the requests to a node that is up and save you from doing this yourself. It also provides a lot of abstractions. The V node, which implements the storage or the logic node of your application, is just a module that React Core takes and then puts on the server where it needs to be. You don't, for you, it's entirely transparent what happens. You say, please send a command to the vnode, and React Core knows where this vnode is, it routes the data there, it handles the data going there, and it handles the data going back to you, which is really, really saving a lot of effort and work. Now, there's a proxy. So load shedding in the case of overload to keep your system healthy, that's also all abstracted away into React Core. It doesn't need to be re-implemented. The whole concept of having a command that is sent somewhere is implemented in React Core and doesn't need to be re-implemented by you. So all in all, if someone would ask me today, what is React Core? The easiest and probably most correct answer would be, it is a framework to build distributed systems, not only databases, but distributed systems in general. Everything that you could abstract in a dynamo fashion, React Core is a brilliant tool to build with. Okay, that would it would it would be it for my slides. Here is the promised link to Laden's email address, along with some other links. There's a link to the Dynamo paper if you want to read in it. There's a link to React in case you don't use it yet. There's a link to Dalmatina DB and there is a really, really good book that is open source, which if you're wanting to learn about React Core, is worth reading. So I put the link here for you. It's a React Core book. It's not written by me. So that's it. Thank you all very much. And if you have some questions, please ask ahead. First of all, uh, Heinz, 
let me say a very big thank you on behalf of us and I'm sure all of our attendees uh, for a very inspiring talk on React Core and also on Dalmatina. I've certainly learned a lot and, um, you know, we've used Dalmatina and React Core on customer projects, but it's fantastic to get your more detailed uh, insights. Although, as you said, this was just scratching the surface. Now, I'd like to formally open up uh, the question and answer session. This is the part of the presentation where all of our attendees are welcome to post questions using the question interface on the webinar. Please post your questions and we will answer them, answer them in, in the order in which they were received. But just to start with the questions that we've already received, first of all, Heinz, it's a bit of a general question, but how do you actually start with React Core? How would you recommend a person starts with React Core? Starting with React Core, there are two things to do. I would start with the React Core book because it's an incredibly good write up. There is also a blog post series called Try, 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 which is really good to read, which is what I started off with myself when I first built a React, system, React Core system. Today, I would go to the book. There is a link in the book is a very simple key value store as an example. And having examples, at least for me, is always a very, very good place to start with because I'm learning by doing. So I personally would go to the book, read it, copy the simple key value star, experiment with it, break it, break it a lot because I kind of break things, um, and then learn from that. Fantastic. Heinz, thank you for that. Now, as questions are pouring in, just to say we'll try and honor as many questions as we can, uh, but again, we can only have a limited amount of time to answer them in. So straight on to the next question. Uh, Gonzalo from uh, our audience is asking, what type of advantages do you receive by storing immutable data on React Core? What advantages I get from immutable data? Um, one of the advantages of immutable data is that you only have two states of data. You either have it written or you don't have it written. So in the case of, this goes into eventual consistency, in the case of an inconsistency, you always know what the right answer is because the right answer is there is data. If you have two conflicting data, that just simply can't happen. So the repair phase in the read repair, if we would look at the two read examples, is trivial. With mutable data, you have the situation where you suddenly have two states of data and it can be tricky to decide which one is true and which one false. Systems like CRDTs help with that, but even they have a significant overhead. So basically the knowledge of what is correct and what is not gets trivial when you have immutable data. Also when it comes to disks, they really like not to move data. So having immutable data means you only write and only append, which disks and computers surprisingly really like. If you have mutable data, you have to rewrite it, you have to delete it, you have to, in the worst case, overwrite it. And that is all operations which are rather costly. With immutable data, those operations do not exist. So you have effectively either a write-only or even an append-only situation on disks, which for writing is really, really what you want. Heinz, thank you for that. That's a very comprehensive answer. Now, moving straight on to the next question. Uh, we have one of our attendees asking, is there a community-managed implementation of React Core that is compatible with Erlang version R20? No. There is one for R19. Um, the, there is a lot of work going on in the React and React Core world right now. I'm pretty sure everyone remembers the sad fate that befell Basho. Um, but quite a few people, including Erlang Solutions, BAT365, the National Health Service, have stepped up to take on the role there. And modernizing React and, in effect, React Core is a big, big part of what's happening there. So while there is no community-driven Erlang 20 version, 
there is a community-driven Erlang 19 version, and soon there will be an Erlang 20 version because that is one of the things I think they are planning for the 3.0 release of React. Please don't quote me on that. Wonderful. Thank you, Heinz. Uh, greatly appreciate it. Now, to try and answer as many questions as we can, we'll move straight on to the next one. Uh, one of our audience mem members, Sergio, is asking, can you list another type of applications um, aside from database um, type products in which React Core really shines? Um, yes, I can. Everything that requires distributed computing. Uh, so, so doing the horrible self-marketing because those are sorry, those are the systems I can talk best about. Um, the main product that Project Pfeiffer produces is the cloud management software, and that is written in React Core on top of React Core. So that is not a database at all. It is a system that manages virtual machines on multiple hosts, and every component in that, the web front end, the Triple A systems, so authentication, authorization, and accounting, as well as the whole business logic, all runs on React Core, and that is a huge advantage. Um, one of the things I like to do when people are looking at that is that you can take down a whole logical node, and everything will keep seamlessly running, which is a real shock compared to other solutions where you have the magic host node that handles everything that goes down. You have a lengthy and manual process to repair it. So everything where you can shard your logic into multiple places, even if it doesn't do storage, is really, really good if you want to build on React Core. Fantastic. Um, Heinz, thank you for that. Can I just move right on to the next question, if you don't mind? Um, you Please know, go. In the world where we hear about a new database every two, three weeks, you know, why, why another database? How would you kind of uh, put the case for React Core, so to speak? Um, React Core is wonderful to build purpose-specific databases. Um, I personally hate rewriting things that already exist. So before I started, Martina DB, I did check if there are other solutions which provide the same requirements, and there simply were not. With React Core, it's possible to build a database that fits exactly one purpose, and by that can outperform general databases by orders of magnitude. So if you have a very specific use case where you need a database for and really need it to shine at this particular thing, React Core is a wonderful tool to do that. You get a lot of the groundwork up. Um, Dalmatina DB was, the first version was written during a, it was called Erlang User Conference then. So pretty much in three afternoons, the first kind of working solution was there. And that just underlines how easy it is with tools like React Core to start a purpose-built specific database. And I think that is where React Core really shines. Since general purpose databases are great, but sometimes you need this little edge you just get when you know exactly what your database is doing. Wonderful. Heinz, thank you for that. Uh, now, this next question ties in nicely to what you've just said, because we've been talking about uh, uh, use cases that React is particularly good for and some use cases that uh, React particularly shines in. But uh, the next question coming from uh, Thanos. Uh, Thanos is asking, can you tell us more about mStore and eStore and how you can actually take the decision uh, to go down this particular path, and how do these solutions interact with React Core? I can repeat the question if you like. No, I got it, but thank you. Um, so React uses LevelDB and Bitcask as storage. Those storages are great for general purpose, a general purpose key value store on disk. mStore and eStore are just like the Martina DB, purpose built for one specific application. And again, it comes from knowing the data. 
eStar is a bit of an oddity, so I want to quickly handle it because it is just a store to handle mostly ordered events, and it is not ex at ex as exciting as the M store. Pretty much just adds files, have an in appends to a file and has an index and a second file for out of order words. M store is more interesting since it is specifically built for ingesting metrics and taking advantage of how disks work. So we know that our disks like sequential reads and writes versus random access. So it's LevelDB features random access for reads quite heavily since it needs to jump around in a file to get all the data if you have multiple um, keys you need to read. MStore ta takes the idea that metrics come in a fixed offset, so in a fixed interval. So it stores a metric point in a specific point in a file that simplifies reading and writing to a mathematical operation which calculates those offsets without the need for an algorithm or logic or seeks, which makes it quite efficient at reading or writing those files. Um, that comes especially into play if you are not using SSDs and have large amounts of data. For example, if you're monitoring hundreds or thousands of systems and kind of want to use the old spinning Rust disks because they are just so much cheaper per gigabyte. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, it certainly does. Yeah, Heinz, thank you for that. Now, again, we've talked about so many things that React Core is uh, good at. Can you tell us a bit about where React Core is actually not particularly useful and not particularly good? Yes, um, I, I think it's always important to know where something is not good to make the to not blanket use it everywhere. Um, React Core gets a bit complicated the moment you want strong consistency. There is a strong consistency part inside of React Core, but you lose a lot of the advantages and the niceties that the eventual consistency gives you. Basically, it might be okay to use it if that is like a edge case in your system, but if you're going for something that requires strong consistency, I would not pick React Core as a foundation to build on. Okay. Heinz, thank you for that. Uh, again, to try and honor the large number of questions we're receiving, we'll move straight on to the next one. Uh, Let's go ahead. Have one of our audience member asking, uh, how does, and this is really interesting, uh, how does Dalmatina DB compare to React time series? Uh, also with time series data in mind. Yes, um, so React time series is a beautiful product, but it handles more general use cases again. It's built on the same concept as React, that you can have complex data. It implements a subset of SQL on top of a eventual consistent key value store. And <clears throat> that in itself is a incredibly interesting idea, and it's wonderful to store event-like data. So if you have, for example, want to record every time someone visits your website or every time someone clicks on a link, um, that too, in a sense, is time series data since it's time indexed with an event. And React Core, no, sorry, React TS offers a very interesting approach to that in having a distributed SQL like system that uses time indices to query your data. Uh, Damatina DB, on the other hand, focuses heavily on this operational metrics where you know you have a fixed interval of metrics and only a timestamp, a value in there and a timestamp as index. So it is a lot simpler when it comes to your data and it works for less use cases, but in those use cases, is able to be significantly faster than React TS would be. On the other hand, if you have a use case where you do not have this very specific characteristics, which is fixed interval one number values, then React, uh, React TS actually lets you do that and lets you do that efficiently while the Matina DB doesn't provide any capabilities in that area. Wonderful, Heinz, uh, thank you for that. Now, 
I think a question that needs to be addressed uh, with everything that's been happening is, uh, you know, with the demise of Basho, what future do you specifically see for uh, React, uh, React Core, and the related React database products? So there is a wonderful open Slack channel where all the people that are interested in the future of React or React Core or its branch offs and the libraries can join. Now, anyone asking this question, I would suggest join that channel and instead of taking my word for it, see for yourself. It is active and wonderful. Um, so I have no doubt that React and React Core and everything related to that will strive and grow. Actually, it might have been a good thing since over the last time, it was very hard for outside contributors to contribute to React Core, to uh, React. And that has to a degree changed. It's now a lot easier to get more people working on it. Um, I maintain a fork of React Core for that reason because it was impossible to get some of the changes I needed back into the up, upstream repository for React Core. Now, it is a lot more likely to have those changes implemented. They are not yet because I have one horrible pull request I am very ashamed of. And it is a mess because it grow over three years. But I'm a lot more confident that some of the changes I required will go back upstream now versus before. So I would say it's going really well for React and the ecosystem around it. Heinz, thank you for answering that question. Now, if you don't mind, I'll give a brief answer to that from our perspective. Uh, Please go. As you know, Bash, uh, Basho have obviously uh, ceased trading. All the React customers that they were serving have consequently lost uh, React support. But I would really reiterate what uh, Heinz has just said. Uh, React has, and increasingly so, an incredibly vibrant community. Uh, we as a company, Erlang Solutions, uh, some of our key partners and customers using React in its different incarnations are absolutely committed to the future of React and are working with the community to ensure that future uh, through ideally a fully open source product. Now, um, just to say that uh, if you're using React at the moment and if you're finding yourself um, stuck and basically running into obstacles, then obviously the community that Heinz mentioned is here. But if you need professional support, then we here at Erlang Solutions provide uh, anything from working hours, working days support to full 24-7 uh, support coverage. So whatever type of help you need with React, uh, we can absolutely uh, extend that help. Uh, so I'll just move to uh, another question, uh, and we can probably slowly wrap up with that. Um, Heinz, you've talked a bit about this, but could you just reiterate what kind of system would one use React Core for exactly? OK. <clears throat> Any system that has two properties. A, it needs to, well, I go back on that. Otherwise, it becomes a Spanish Inquisition joke. That has some of the following properties. Um, it can be eventual consistent. So you are not required to, at any point in time, get the same answer from every node. So if you're OK with eventually getting the right answer, in some exchange cases, you're good. Um, second, you have the ability to shard your work. So your work never requires the entire set of data you're working on, but rather you have some kind of combination between a key and a bucket that you can use to shard your work off. Third, you are going to spread your system over multiple physical hosts and know that you will add and remove them and some will fail and some will survive. If you do not have more than one node, there's no need to add a system as complex as React Core to your software. Um, 
finally, you do not require to handle storage. You can build a message queue on React Core. You can build a pub sub system. You can build simple logic where processing power is scheduled on different nodes on React Core. That all works. So the whole it is a database is something you don't require to be to re, for React Core to be useful for you. So basically. A, you're OK with eventual consistency. And if you're not 100% sure what that means in your case, I suggest talking to someone who has a little experience. B, you are using more than one node and plan to scale out. C, you can chart your work, whether it's storing data or processing data or sending messages. As long as those three things are ticked, React Core might be a really good solution for you. Heinz, thank you for that. Completely agreed. So basically stay on the right side of uh, the cap theorem, so to speak, depending on your use yeah. case. Now, uh, I'm sorry to say that we have to finish here. Uh, we've received a lot of questions. Some of them we will have to answer in writing uh, as time is upon us, so to speak. I would really like to once again thank Heinz for an incredibly inspiring talk, uh, both React Core and Dalmatina DB are technologies that we've seen widely used across sectors. And where, uh, for example, in the case of Dalmatina DB, we've had customers coming and uh, praising its uh, incredible performance. So um, I'd like to thank many, uh, many, many uh, times as well, all of you who have joined us for the webinar. Thank you as members of our audience. Uh, please join us again for our next monthly webinar. And I should say that the next webinar we'll be holding will happen on March 28th. On that occasion, we will have uh, Eric Stenman from Eternity Blockchain talking about Eternity and the topic of scalable smart contracts interfacing with real world data. Uh, now, please note that the recording of this webinar and the presentation that was shared today will also be emailed to all attendees and will, in time after that, become available for you uh, to view on our corporate website as well at www.erlang-solutions.com. Thank you all once again. Thank you, Heinz. And we look forward to seeing everyone on our next webinar. Thank you all for listening, and thank you a lot for having me. It was a real pleasure. <laughs>